All right. Well, hello, world. Welcome back to Golf Subpar with Colt Nost and Drew Stoltz. And I guess we should start it off by saying, oh, Canada, my goodness gracious, what a tournament the RBC Canadian Open is, was. But first, before we get to that, Sleaze, as always, you know, we don't always play great, but we look great. And that's because of our people over at RLX. The RLX Golf Collection draws inspiration from the traditional aesthetic of polo, updating it to create a modern sensibility focused on performance-driven design. From sophisticated styles to the most technologically advanced fabrics available, RLX Golf is the ultimate in functional luxury and provides pieces that are ready for whatever the conditions bring, on the course or off. You're rocking the polo. I'm rocking the polo. You look good. You play good. Pretty simple. Ralph Lauren is the official outfitter of the United States Ryder Cup team and partner of the AJGA. Ralph Lauren is proud to continue its sponsorship of golf ambassadors Tom Watson, Davis Love III, Jonathan Bird, Smiley Kaufman, Nick Watney, Billy Horschel, Doc Redman, Trevor Werbelow, Andrea Lee, Devin Bling, Zach Johnson, and Sean Foley. The RLX Golf Collection is available in select Ralph Lauren stores, exclusive private clubs and resorts, and online at ralphlauren.com. And later, we're going to be live at the Ralph Lauren Beverly Hills with our man, Billy Ho, for this week's episode. Going to be a lot of fun. Sleaze, you look great. Sophisticated men deserve sophisticated gear, Colt, and we are all three that. I think everyone would agree with that. Uh that point um looking forward to that looking forward to catching up with billy and as you mentioned earlier oh canada what a hell of an event that was i thought honestly um of all the events this year that might have been the most fun the most dramatic especially with all the shit that was going on earlier in the week with the live and the pga it was a nice little refresher just to have a passionate tournament where the fans were going nuts they finally got a canadian winner up there and they just get a winner they got a four-hole playoff with a 72 foot walk-off eagle to take the thing Granted, Adam Hadwin almost lost his life, got body bagged up there, but good to know security is tight <laughs> in Canada. Do doing? not even think of slipping up in Canada. They will crush your skull. I mean, that was unbelievable. Took away from the moment a little bit, but I mean, I think that video has been shown more than Nick Taylor's 72-foot eagle putt to win. I mean, excuse me, Mr. Security Guard, I know you take your job very seriously. Do we have to tackle the guy to the ground? Maybe we just grab him and be like, excuse me, who the hell are you? What are you doing down here spraying champagne? And then once you realize it's Adam Hadwin, okay, proceed. We don't have to tackle the guy to the ground. I mean, you could have hurt him, cost him the season. God knows what could have happened. Yeah, uh, you know that guy's been waiting all week. All The only action he's had all week is telling some frat kids to quiet down while people are hitting. And then finally he saw his moment. There is a rogue individual charging towards the champion. It's time to show what I got. You've been waiting a long time to do that. Um, yeah, they got their money's worth up there in Canada on the security side. But uh, Hadwin, he might have snuck his way into the PIP just with his one clip. You don't have to tweet or do shit the rest of the year. This one alone might have just got him up there. Um, but that was a hell of an ending, a little cherry on the top. You were up there all week, dude. It looked like, I mean, the fans, they show out in Canada, man. Listen, you know, they get one professional golf, one major professional golf tournament a year and it's the canadian open they haven't had a canadian born winner in 69 years i mean and they have to talk about nice. it every single time they show up and there it is nick taylor opens with 75 on thursday he's in 120th place and just absolutely flips the switch gets on fire and played some unbelievable golf i can't imagine what he was feeling coming down the stretch in regulation trying to get this thing done i mean the weight of a nation on his shoulders so he's, I, I saw when I got home today, the the replay was on, and I saw the last couple holes, and like it was loud on TV. I, I, I it's so hard for me to describe. It was ridiculous how loud it was down there in the fairways. I had to turn my headset so loud when I was walking in the playoffs and coming up eighteen with those guys. It was wild out there. I mean, Justin Rose, Shane and Lowry, like, dude, this is a like a Ryder Cup out here. I know there's not that they have a Presidents Cup in Canada, not a Ryder Cup, but that's how loud it was. They were so passionate. It was awesome. Yeah, it's like the only individual or regular term of the year where there was like a line drawn in the sand. It's like, we're all from Canada. We want the Canadian to win. And then the guys that were hanging around waiting for the charter to go to L.A. on the European side were like, we're for Tommy. And it was basically that much of a line. It was like two sides, basically. Everyone up there wanted Nick Taylor to win. I almost kind of felt bad for Fleetwood because I think you mentioned it on the broadcast. I was like, if he wins this, it's going to be kind of like when VJ Singh beat Mike Weir up here. They mm -hmm. know what a big deal it would be, or kind of like when Stuart Sink beat Tom Watson at the Open Championships, like, damn, dude, I know everyone in the world was probably rooting for this, you know, this story to happen, and he was the one standing in the way with it, but it's like, he didn't slip out, he didn't, he didn't give it away to anything, I mean, the dude made a 72 and a half foot 
eagle putt to take it. But the energy on that behind that 18th green with all the players still hanging around. Typically, you get a few like the best friends of the guys hang out. And they give them high fives after it. This one, the plane wasn't leaving without them. So they're like, we're going to stick around and watch this thing. And it added a nice, a nice vibe to it. You know, I was talking to the tournament director. Amanda and I did that set there on, on the rink hole, the 14th hole, which was awesome. Except I got booed wearing Calgary Flames. First off, I, it was not for the Flames. It was for our boy, Mike Commodore. I rocked the Commodore jersey. Once they realized it was that, they were okay with it. But when I walked onto the tee box the first time, they weren't happy. I'm like, wrong city, bud. Get out of here. What are you doing, you hoser? Um, but anyways, it ended up being a oh, lot it? of fun. But yeah, the, the atmosphere, everything. I mean, speaking to the tournament director, I was like, all right, you got your chance. You got your choice. You can have Rory McIlroy win or a Canadian. He goes, dude, it's like, it's not even close. Like Rory is incredible. He goes, but a Canadian, he goes, if a Canadian wins, Rory McIlroy is a golf story. If a Canadian wins, it's a, the entire nation. It's a story across the entire nation. Like that's how big a deal this was. I mean, he was on the front page of every magazine Monday morning, every pa- every newspaper. It was it was cool, man. I was so happy to be there and get to see. I love Nick Taylor. He's a good friend of mine too. And just to see him do it, break the drought, man. It uh, what a way to go out. Yeah, they've been waiting for that thing. They finally got it. Rory's a big story anywhere he wins, but he's won the last two. Uh, and it's been almost 70 years since they got a Canuck to win that thing. So shout out Nick Taylor. That's um, You ain't going to be buying too many drinks uh, north of the border for the rest of your life. Like, that's how big this thing was. I mean, it was a perfect lead up to this week, our National Open. And uh, yeah. it was nice just to put all the other stuff, like I said, to bed for a while. Just actually watch some fun golf and not argue and speculate and all the stuff that's been going on. Yeah, and, and and for RBC, I mean, two years, they didn't have the tournament because of COVID. Then last year, you know, they're going up against Liv's debut. And then this year, you've got this whole merger thing going on. It's like, can we uh, pay some respect to this National Open? And then they get one of the best finishes we'll probably have all season, if not the best. Um, but speaking of Roy McIlroy, I did have dinner with him. I think you need to go sit down with him at the U.S. Open. Y'all got some making up to do. I don't know what you did, but... um. <laughs> I, well, please, I don't where know. is this coming from? I, I've never had a conversation with him. I've never even bad mouthed him. I've never done anything. So I, I don't know. This feels extremely contrived. This feels like the the, the golf shoe incident at Colonial. Uh, we'll get to the bottom of this. But, I will um, own Colonial. This I had nothing to do with. Smiley Kaufman will tell you the same thing. I just think if the U.S. Open, if you happen to run into him, maybe introduce yourself. Say, Rory, I'm a big fan. Oh. Heard you're not the biggest fan of mine. Maybe we could talk this thing out. Well, this is this is great, great <laughs> podcast material. I got a few other tour players that I'll I'll bring on too, and we can um we can share thoughts on one another. This will be good. But there's uh um, yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing uh what happened. Maybe uh maybe uh, I don't know. I don't know what it could be. I don't either. But uh, it's gonna very, be a I'm a very lovable character. It's gonna be a lot of fun out there at L.A. Country Club this week. I mean, right in the heart of L.A. It's gonna be an awesome scene. The U.S. Open, L.A. Country Club. I mean, this this is the first U.S. Open they've ever hosted. Everyone is so excited about this week. I know you just got out there. I'm heading out tomorrow. Um, I can't wait to get out there, but it's going to be a fun week. Uh, I just checked into the hotel not too long ago. There is a movie premiere party happening as we speak. Uh, they're all showing up in the lobby. There's some choice, I will say, outfits. Um, things if Margot Robbie here. happened to be in this if movie. If Margot shows up, I'm flying out cancel now. everything. Yes. Cancel the whole, the whole week's off if Margot shows up. Haven't seen her yet. Um, but yeah, it's going down. There's a lot of action. It's hard as hell to get around here. And this golf course is going to be spectacular. Just the pictures that I've seen of it. Uh, I can't wait to see what this thing looks like. And I got um, full faith that it's going to test everyone. And it looks firm and bouncy right now. And Colt, you talked about, uh, you know, paying respects to the Canucks up there this week. It's time to pay some respect to our boys at Rock Form because they are back. You know what it is. It's the best golf speaker in the game and it's not just for golf it's for everywhere you take it to the pool take it anywhere with you we've talked about the magnets these things do not quit no clamps needed stick it to the cart and go the sound is good waterproof drank proof they're damn near indestructible i've dropped mine before it just keeps on ticking colt tell them about the battery dude i mean these things they, they don't stop either uh everyone forgets to charge their speaker good news is with rock form you can play about five rounds and have no stress at all the thing just keeps on ticking that's it. So go to rockform.com, enter code subpar for 25% off. Great little Father's Day gift that's coming up. Great gift for yourself. That's R O K F O R M.com, code subpar for 25% off. All right, let's get to our guest. We've had him on before, but now we're Team RLX, Team Polo. 
and so is he. We're going to be coming to you live from the Ralph Lauren in Beverly Hills. We got our man Billy Ho on subpar. Here he is. All right, what a special day this is here. We are live in Beverly Hills, California. Polo Ralph Lauren store, a.k.a. the house that Billy built. <laughs> we got Billy Boy everywhere in here. We're joined by the seven-time PGA Tour winner, winner of uh, last year's President's Cup as well, member of that team. Congratulations. Here Thank to talk you. a little U.S. Open, a little polo, and all things golf. Thanks for being on, Billy. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure to be on with you boys. First off, one of you is a lot to handle. We are currently surrounded by three of you. Yeah, this there is Thank God those posters can't talk. You know, Photoshop's a wonderful thing. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I was just about to ask you, when you see these, and they're like, hey, we're going to run with this, and you're like, just a little juice on the arms. You know what I mean? A little. Do you have full uh, I think editing starting, power on the Photoshop? No, I don't, but... I think they need to start taking some of the wrinkles out. I'm getting a little more wrinkles around oh, the yeah. eyes. So the they could feet. Yeah. You know, shows but, wisdom, Billy. Uh, yeah, exactly. But I think they're doing a really good job with uh, making me look tanner, okay. which, you know, I think makes you look better if you're a little tan. You could just be honest and tell us that you spray tan before these photo shoots. <laughs> I, <laughs> add some veins. Add some veins. A little I'm more not, vascular. Oh, oh my gosh. Wow, Seth was Seth in the Wall house. Seth in the house. Good to just see stepping it. right in front of the camera. Yeah, no big come on in, Seth. No big deal, Seth. That not on. You run the show around here. <laughs> no, not at all. This is this is live. Uh, no, no, I mean hat. I'm not gonna lie. Back in the day, early on in Ralph Lauren, oh, in my days, here we go. I used to go to the tanning beds before yes. some photo shoots, like two weeks before, to get a good layer on and everything. And then I, I've gotten older. I'm like, I'm just I'm not doing that. Okay. You live well, in Florida. <laughs> yeah, there's a tanning bed outside. outside. Yeah, but that means I have to spend at least hours outside. Oh, you, you want know, just quick? Twelve minutes in a tanning bed. I think it was or whatever. Flip both sides, you're good to go. Just a nice burn, a little foundation burn. Wow. Exactly. Turns into tan. Well, exactly. we know what teaser number one is going to be. Billy, <laughs> Billy, Billy Ho goes to the tanning bed. <laughs> Billy tans. We all knew. Oh, we all knew. That is yes. Billy. Well, let's talk. We're here in Beverly Hills for the U.S. Open, L.A. Country Club. I mean, this is a unique, special place. I mean, right in the heart of L.A. Give us your first thoughts on walking out because this is a place a lot of people, they've never seen it before. You're exactly right. Exactly right. Um, it's funny. I... I've heard that this is the most expensive piece of real estate anywhere in the world that a golf course is on. And I'm thinking, you got Pebble Beach, you got St. Andrews and everything. And then I come here and I see why. 36 holes and you see all the office buildings, all the apartments, all the high-end condos around. Um, I understand why now. Uh, after playing uh, nine holes on Sunday, nine holes Monday, I think I get a little bit of like maybe an Australian feel with the course a little That's bit. That's what I said, yeah. Um, fairways are pretty generous. They run out a little bit. You can somewhat play the ball along the ground to some of these uh, these greens. And just the way the greens are and the way the bunkers are, not so much in the way they uh, keep the condition of the bunkers, but you know, being deep below the greens, it reminds me of a lot of Australia. And I've only been down there once, but watching it a lot on TV, and I love that style of golf. Uh, it, it gives me that that feel a little bit. And the fairways are shaved like into the bunkers down there, like you'd see at Royal yeah. Melbourne or something like that. I love that aspect of it. It's it's different. With Agree. All that Agree. And I think it's it's going to be a very unique unique test. I think uh, the front nine. I'm I'm more. I enjoy the front nine more. I think the way it's designed and everything. It just. It, I think it's a little bit fairer, in my opinion. Um, and I just I believe that. You're going to see some really good scores. You're going to see some bad scores. It's the driving's not overly difficult. Um, you're going to have to really be precise in, in how you where you land your ball on the green and, and shore the green. And course management, probably more so than ever any U.S. Open I've played in, it is probably going to be very vital this week. Yeah, I, you know, you mentioned you, it gives you plenty of room off the tee, but the fairways are sloped, so you can take some. Maybe if it's 40 yards wide, it really plays like closer Correct. to 25 or 30. But I agree with you about the course management. I think around the greens can get really, really tricky. So for you, I mean, we're, we're like we get the traditional U.S. Open courses, you know, the Oakmonts, the Wingfoots, which are just brutal, lush, rough, and it. They don't like USGA doesn't like to admit it, but they like it to be around even par. Yes. There is no doubt about it. Would you say this week when I played it in February, I thought you know I could see someone possibly getting to double digits this week. You know, I I could see that if the course is going to play the way it did Sunday when I was here. The greens were very receptive, and then I played yesterday, and they were pretty firm. Okay. Um, and we're going to have perfect weather. We're not going to have any rain. A lot of sun. Um, they're going to get this course the way they want. I think even par is a very, very realistic score. Wow, okay. Um, you know, you could see something maybe in the five under par mm -hmm. range winning, 
Uh, I just don't see double digits. I think if someone shoots double digits, it's, it's very similar to what Tiger did uh, 2000 at Pebble Beach. Mm -hmm. The guy, that person would just be playing unbelievable golf for four, four days, um, be at the peak of his game. Uh, I just think there's just, you know, your misses here are really going to be punished, um, especially on some of these par threes. And you're going to hit some really good drives that, you know, may take a bad bounce and end up in the rough and everything. So it's it's going to be interesting. I just don't see double digits. If it was if it was a wet, you know, soft U.S. Open, I could see that around this place because the driving isn't overly difficult. The greens are fairly big, and they're going to they would play even bigger with how soft they would be. Yeah, my my thought was it. There is going to be, if you do put the ball in the fairway, you will have several wedges, which I think, obviously, with you guys and y'all's skill level, you can really take advantage of it. I think someone that's really on with their driver Correct. this week, and just they give themselves so many chances. Now, the par threes, for the most part, are brutal, and that's going to be a key. I mean, I think if you can go through and play the par threes, maybe one, two over par for the week, you're doing really good. You're exactly right. I think, um, you know, my stats guy, Mark Horton, would create a profile if we had data. Uh, of previous opens here or previous tournaments here. And, and one of those things would be par threes play, you know, one or two of a par for the week. You're, you're gaining multiple shots on the field, a couple shots on the field throughout the week. So it's something like first time since like 1942, there's been five par threes at a U.S. Open. Exactly. And listen, the two that are going to be, well, there's going to be all of them going to be talked about. Three that are really going to be talked about is number 15, which is a great little par three at 125 yards that may play 77 yards. I think it's a great l little hole. Um, and then you're going to talk number seven and number 11 are going to be talked about because of 280 yards. One is downhill 15 or 20 yards. So it's not going to really play its true yardage. Uh, but I'm not a big fan of, of 280 yard yeah. par threes. I've never been a big fan. I think, I think the ninth hole is a, is a beautiful par three. The green's 40 deep, not very wide, uh, and it's uphill, and it's going to be a great little par three. I think we all know in professional golf, and we've all said it, the old adage, name me one great par three over 200 yards. Yeah. No, yeah. Still all the waiting. greatest still ones waiting. you name are like, they're under like 150. You're more exactly or less. Right. What have you hit on those two holes? Because people see the, they see the 290. Uh, you know, on Instagram or whatever, I'm like, oh my God, that's driver. But what's it really playing like effectively? So number number seven, I'm probably gonna have to hit through it every day because it's, I think it's like 275 or 270 to the front, somewhere around there. And the run up area compared to number 11, isn't very. There isn't very much run up area there. There's a little bit to the left, and um, you're gonna have to land that close to the front edge of the green. Number 11 now, there's 25 yards short of the green that you can. 25 or 30 yards short of the green, you can land the ball and run it up. I hit five wood on, on Monday, landed at about 15, 20 yards, 15 yards short, and it ran, ran up to the front edge of the green. So um, that hole, I'm probably just going to be trying to land at 10, 15 yards short. Uh, compared to number seven, I'm probably going to be flying, trying to get closer to the front edge of the green. Uh, and also, that fairway short of number seven is sort of slanted upward, so it's going to be tough with the ball to bounce and jump forward. Yeah, that, that seven's a monster. I mean, Depending on where the pin is on number six, six as a par four could possibly technically play shorter than the par three, seventh, or eleventh. You're exactly right. It's going to be interesting. I think uh, what the scoring average, we, we sort of joked about some of the scoring average on these par threes and par fours. Like number eight may, could possibly play to a lower scoring average than um, the number six, mm -hmm. possibly one day. And you know, depending on the conditions and everything, you know, it, it's going to be very close. I would say very close to number seven, but it's a part three. But I could see number number eight playing, you know, 4.3 one day yeah. easily. And I could see number six playing 4.35. Yeah. You know, even though it's a short hole, you know, where that pin is and the decisions guys make, it could be – it's going to be very difficult. So, uh, I, like I said, I love the front because I think there's more strategy and there's more fairness to the front. Uh, I would say, than, than maybe, I would say, the backside. The rough is normally, like, you know, the headliner. Going in the U.S. Open, they've done the graduated roughs, but there's all the people dropping balls, and they vanish and all that <laughs> stuff. I walked around the golf course today. It seemed, like, spotty to me. There's some areas sure. where I was like, that's a problem. You're probably not getting a whole lot of club on that ball. And there's some where I was like, I think you could hit whatever you want out of that. Is that more or less the way it is? It's kind of like just luck of the draw if you hit it in there? I agree. It was funny. I was uh, I saw those videos, I think, Saturday and Sunday, and I, I sort of laughed because they're going to, like, these random spots in the course and find these rough and dropping it. And I'm like, where I haven't seen anything like that. Like, there's some rough out there that is spotty, like you said, and if you um, – 
you know, you could draw a good lie, you could draw a bad lie. That's Bermuda Rough. We've played in Bermuda Rough. We know what can happen. But uh, I think what is the nastiest is some of the rough around the bunkers, around the greens, which is sort of like St. Augustine grass. It reminds me a lot of St. Augustine grass. Very long. You could get that ball could be teed up, you know, four inches above the ground, or it could sit down depending on how it comes in. So that stuff's some pretty nasty uh, stuff around these greenside bunkers. I want to go back to one of the par threes real quick because number 15, I mean, like you said, one day they're most likely going to move it up. It's going to be 77, 78 yards. We saw it at the Walker Cup when it was here. And it's over on that front right section, which is about seven yards deep. Yeah. I mean, talk about that as a player. I mean, one, you don't tee up a lob wedge nope, very no. often. But when you come to a hole like that, I mean, it's something we've never seen before. It's going to be by far the shortest par three in U.S. Open history, maybe in professional golf. Yeah, it is. It's, I don't know of another par three yeah. in, in my time of watching golf and playing that I've seen played shorter. You know, my, my only issue with that is uh, my one worry, not issue, is that if the green gets too firm, if guys are landing a lob wedge that are in the seven yards deep, um, if they land it on the green, is that ball going to bounce in the back bunker? You know, if you land it two yards on, is that ball going to take a big bounce and go in the back bunker or uh, maybe in that back rough? Or is a good shot going to get rewarded? Mm -hmm. And that's what we all care about. You hit a quality golf shot, it should get rewarded. And we're going to come to find out what that is and how the USGA does because we know historically they don't, they don't do a very good job of, of letting quality golf shots get rewarded mm -hmm. Uh, throughout the t throughout history, uh, the record's not very good in that. They've had some issues. It's gotten yeah. better over it's the gotten years. Better. They have a dude with a hose out there on standby. <laughs> it's gotten wait, better. The last be the couple years guy. have been unbelievable. Um, you know, actually, I was thinking about this when they do play at 77 yards and that pin be on the front right corner. I was like, man, maybe I'll just hit it, sh you know, right of the green in the little fairway yeah. cut because that should be sh softer. The ball will bounce, you know, spin, and I'll just be, you know, 10 feet off the green and, and have a putt up the green. You know? Lay up on the 77-yard hole. Exactly. That would be beautiful. Lay up on Is that one, though, yard. like for guy, like if you're coming down the stretch in contention, like if you're on a par five like you're typically, and you're laying up your number, I don't know many people that lay it up to like, I like 70. It's kind of just like an awkward little shot. Do you think that potentially becomes more difficult than like, I would just rather hit a full six iron from 200? Yeah. No. I, I'll, I'll take a lob. killed I'll, by the analytics people for that, by the way. I'll take a lob wedge every day yeah, over I'm six I'm not saying you'll score better. <laughs> but, but I'm just saying when you've got all the juices going, that's you, a touchy little shot. I get what you're saying, but if you're if you do your wedge drills or you you know you work on your wedge yardages, a 77 yard wedge shot should not be that difficult. Off a tee, also. I'm not even going to tee it up. I'll are put it gonna, on the ground. Are you going to peg it? No, I'm going to. Oh, no oh. chance I'm going to peg a 77 yard wedge shot lob wedge. I mean. L O D King. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lob, wedge lob off the deck. deck. <laughs> lob <laughs> off the deck, dude. Uh, no, guy. but I mean, it's it's going to be it's going to be interesting. This is going to be a really cool uh, tournament to watch and how the USGA does and sets it up. Um, I we talked about this earlier, and I'll bring this up now. I feel sorry for the fans because I don't think the viewing out on the golf course is going to be very good for them. Mm -hmm. There's going to be holes. They're not going to be able to get close to the greens. They're not going to see, um, you know, stuff around the greens. They're not going to be near tee boxes. You know, I, I feel sorry for the fans uh, once again in that situation. And then us for players, we love having the fans around the greens. We love having the fans close to tee boxes because you can feed off that energy. You can feel the energy that they, you know, they're giving off. And you're not going to have that. You're not going to have those roars real close to the greens, it's going to be sort of like um, maybe delayed like number 12 at Augusta. Okay. Because, yeah. you know, they're going to be far away, and some people may not see the ball go in the hole, and you're going to – the ball's going to go in the hole, and then they're going to realize it's in the hole, and then they cheer. Okay. So that will be interested to see, like, you know, where – because number 18, there is yeah. no grandstands behind it because the membership wanted that clubhouse to be seen mm -hmm. all on TV. So it will be interesting to see, you know, how they treat the fans there. You mentioned, I mean, you're, you're an emotional player. You, you like to get fired up out there. I got to ask you about last week, RBC Canadian Open. I'm sure you were watching. Or at least you saw it. <laughs> Who won? <laughs> but just for, I mean, you, you, you've represented your country playing at the Walker Cup. For him, being a Canadian, breaking that long drought. I mean, I was there in person. I know you were watching on TV. How cool is that for Nick Taylor? That was really cool. I was watching in my room, and two of the two great guys on the PGA Tour – uh, you know, Nick's won a couple times. Tommy has not won on the PGA Tour. Um, and you've got all of Canada pulling for Nick Taylor, and no one's pulling for Tommy Fleetwood, uh, except for maybe Justin Rose, Shane Lowry, Terrell Hatton, who is there watching. Um, but I thought it was really cool to see. And, I mean, 
when he made that putt, it was like he was in shock. He was in shock it went in. And then he was like, oh, my gosh, I just won the Canadian Open. I just won my national title. Uh, that's pretty cool. I mean, that's it's something that they're really passionate about. It's no different than an American being passionate about winning the U.S. Open or winning, you know, the Ryder Cup or the President's Cup or Walker Cup. Uh, so, yeah, it, it was uh, for them to finally break the drought, have Mike Weir there, who, who is Canadian golf, mm -hmm. who really is taking it to the next level. You know, a lot of these guys look up to him. He was the reason they played a game of golf. At least, uh, or at least the Canadian they looked up to when they were no growing doubt. up. Yeah. No, it was. I mean, I was there. I told Slees like, being on the ground in person. Like, t I saw the replay TV. It was loud on TV. In person, it was a joke. Like, I had to turn my headset so loud because it was place was going nuts. It was. I mean, it was. Uh, I mean, you saw everyone, and they all started. I think they started charging the green. I mean, I know Adam Hadwin did. He got <laughs> smoked. Got body bag. Uh, I mean, listen, he took the hit pretty solid. And he got back up and, and, and was ready to go again. But, uh, no, I mean, listen, that was, that was a surreal moment that, um, you know, for Nick and even for the Canadian boys, they're going to remember for a long, long time. Yeah, it had a unique feel in that it was like an individual tournament. It wasn't a team event, a President's Cup, a Ryder Cup, but it had that feel. It was yeah. like, and basically all in Canada, like you said, 99% of the people out there were for Nick. But the last time we had you on, you were talking to about how much it would mean for you to play for your country. And you did that last year. You got on the President's Cup team. Was it everything you hoped it would be? Yeah, it was. I mean, I, I tell people this. The golf was awesome. You know, we won. You know, the, the moments out there were unbelievable. But I think the thing that I enjoyed the most and I wish would have lasted longer, and it's no different than our World Cup days, is everything that led up to it. Just hanging out at the hotel, you know, playing practice rounds, you know, just enjoying ourselves and, you know, learning from each other on the course and everything. Like, those were moments. Like, I mean, Freddie Couples was one of my role models, and I've gotten to know Freddie, but to be able to spend, you know, the entire week with Freddie and see him in a different light and, and see the guy he is and how great, how much he loves these team competitions, like, it was really cool. Like, that could have lasted two, three weeks, and I still wouldn't have been bored from it. Yeah, that's the, I agree with you. That's the best part. The practice rounds leading up, the dinners, everything. And then once it starts, it's like, oh, my God, it's over. It, it is over. It flies by. Exactly. But you're, um, you're a huge team golf guy. Got to ask you, you're a proud Florida Gator. Mm. Your Gators won the national championship this year. J.C. Deacon. Coach Deke. Dudley Hart let them, helped lead them to victory. They, were a, they had a squad. How proud were you of your boys? Uh, very happy. Listen, they've, they've had a really quality team over the last couple of years, and – they just haven't, you know, got it done. They haven't produced when they needed to. Um, you know, Dudley has come in, and let me say this. JC, I give JC a lot of credit. Uh, we had a conversation, you know, summer of 21, and um, I just told him some things that I felt like he needed to do better with the program. And, encouragement. Yeah, yeah, encouragement. And, you know, JC realized it, you know, made some changes, brought in Dudley Hart, brought in somebody who did things – well that he didn't do you know uh, and so Dudley is very structured practice the way you, you practice things you work on he's very great at doing that and he brought that to the team and that's been a very uh, beneficial to all the players and JC understands that that's not JC um, Forte you know he's better at you know getting the kids motivated you know recruiting you know making sure everyone's doing a really good job you know keeping the team together staying positive um, and so it was awesome. Fred Biondi winning the individual title. The kid is unbelievable. He's so, so good. Great dude. Um, and he's an unbelievable yeah. – he's even a better person. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but to see those kids and how much they've worked the last couple of years after, I'm not going to lie, I've reamed them a couple of times going over there. I've been, I've been the volunteer assistant the last couple of years. <laughs> and, I've, Billy, and I've And I've gone yeah, over yeah, there. Volunteer. And, I, and I've reamed them a couple of times in some meetings and, and sense of how hard they worked and, and certain things they didn't do correctly. Um, and, and, you know, they answered. They answered everything I asked of them to do and everything that J.C. and Dudley did. So, uh, yeah, it was nice to see Florida Gators back uh, winning a national title, and, and hopefully this is just a start of a, of a long run of J.C. and Dudley being there and, and winning more SEC and national titles to come. Yeah, clean sweep with the Indy champ with Fred, and then you got the team title as well. I, Fred had a tough decision with, like, hey, do I want to – Stay amateur. He's got. He could have played this week at, the, at LA. He's got Augusta waiting for him if he wants. It uh, elected to turn pro. Did, did you talk to him at all? Are you? Is your relationship like that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I didn't talk to him about turning pro. I would have said turn pro, don't wait. Um, I feel like 
uh, he was ready to turn pro. You, you know, you can wait, but you you lose your opportunities and, and you learn you lose the ability of, of learning at the next level, at the professional level. And and you know, Colt, and it's you made, so long, too. and it's so long. Yeah. Listen, I I think some of these roles now. Uh, some of these players need to turn. Like Fred's a senior. Like he's not yeah. going to stay amateur. You should let him give him a spot in the U.S. Open. Um, Fred L- Ridley is the, obviously <laughs> a chairman of yes. Augusta National, and mm-hmm. he's a proud Florida Gator. Uh, I will, uh, you know, hopefully cross paths or maybe reach out to him. But I feel like maybe Augusta should, you know, make an exception to that rule, seeing that he spent he spent his four years there. He graduated. He's going to turn pro. Let him turn pro. And still be able to compete in Augusta and, and the Masters uh, come next April. Who knows if that's really going to happen? But I think that's the right thing to do in the game of golf. You know, that's been a, a popular topic. I mean, a lot of a popular opinion. The, the thing is, you know, Augusta. It's just they have that history of amateur golf, mm. and I don't think they're going to make an exception for that. But you, it does help that Fred Ridley is a. Florida if there Gator. was ever going to be <laughs> a change, this might be the year that it happened. You know, like you know what. We will change that. You know what? And, and, and I look at it differently. You, you've got the U.S. Amateur Champion. You've got the Latin America Champion. You've got the uh, Asia Amateur Champion. Mm-hmm. You've got some other a- uh, amateurs that have won, you know, more of what people would consider an amateur title. Mm-hmm. And they're going to stay amateur. But I think when you look at the NCAA, I think there's a – I would make it – if I was chairman, I would say, hey, listen – if you qualify for if you win the individual NCAA individual title your senior year and which would get you into Augusta I would give you you're welcome to turn pro I'll give you that spot because you spent four years in college you got your degree you've won this title why are you going to make the guy you know stay amateur for another yeah. 11 months to be able to play in this tournament when he wants to turn pro. If that's what he wants to do and that's his next path and, and his journey in, in, in golf, let him do it and still give him the spot. Now, it would be different if it was maybe a sophomore or junior, but, you know, because he has that ability to stay. He hasn't used his eligibility through college. It's not up anymore. Um, he made that decision to leave college early. I would just sort of say, hey, if, it's, if he spent four years and his eligibility is up and he won the NCAA his senior year, you know, he has a he would he can turn pro and still have his spot if he wanted. No, I agree with yeah. you. I mean, the USGA has obviously changed their stance because when Victor Hovland finished twelfth as an amateur, they're like, you know what, we want our U.S. amateur champion, whether he's pro or amateur, which is great. Maybe they do that with the NCAA. I want to talk a little bit about your game. I know twenty twenty three hasn't been what you want it to be, but as I texted you a few weeks ago, <laughs> you were one of the hardest workers I've ever seen in my life. You know, I, I know you're not going to you're not going to stop working hard. How are we feeling about the game? We getting closer. Yeah, listen, I it's been a tough year. There's no doubt about it. I think uh, when you have so much love and passion for something that you do, and you put so much effort into it, doesn't matter if it's golf, doesn't matter if it's for your job, life, whatever. You know, for you know a significant other, and you're not getting what you want out of that. Uh, you know that that other side is not giving that love back. <laughs> uh, it wears on you. There's no yeah. doubt about it. And, and the game of golf has has uh, been beating me down a little bit. Um, I've been fortunate enough. I haven't had to ha- deal with any of that in my 14 years as a professional, four years in college. I've been, you know, pretty smooth sailing. But this is just my little, you know, little bump or big bump in the road. Um, we've been working hard. I've been feeling better about the game. Uh, I think we made I, – I don't want to say we – we made a breakthrough today because I think we have, but I don't want to, you know, jinx myself. But uh, Todd Anderson and I went over to Brentwood Country Club this morning. We got on uh, the Gears 3D system with Michael Neff and, and Tanya, who was the director of golf or head, one of the instructors over there. And we just want to see some data. Like, technically on video, it looks good. Everything looks good. Like, there's something that wasn't allowing me to hit the cut. And lo and behold, Michael Neff um, – says listen the swing's unbelievable hand pass great you know the way you're rotating all these numbers that we need to have you know that we look for you know you can't do any better and at the end of the day he's like your issue is that your clubs are too upright for you no way yeah which have you played the same specs for forever yeah i have and i'm not sure if there was somewhere in the transition of when i was at pxg the numbers may have got changed a little bit or you know when I went from PXG you know with no club deal to ping and then um, you know I always said okay well I want to try these tireless irons and then 
somewhere something happened. And I'm not sure, I'm not blaming anyone at all, uh, but things happen like that. And it may have been also when I, I, the swing has changed a lot. Like a year ago, my handle at impact was a lot higher than it is now. It's a lot lower, um, which makes a dramatic difference. And so now we just, you know, we went, uh, it was great information. It was one little piece of advice. Uh, we went and worked with Tyler this afternoon, uh, bent some irons a little flatter. That seemed to work a little bit. And then um, I still felt like the heel was digging. Uh, JJ with Tyler uh, was like, hey, what if we just add some more bounce back into these irons so it allows it to get through the turf? It doesn't dig as much. And he built me up a set, and, and um, I'm, I'm really excited with what I'm seeing. Uh, and so now it's sort of just trusting the equipment and, and trusting if I make the swing I need to make, the ball is going to cut. At the end of the day, I was, I was, you know, didn't have the complete trust and confidence that if I made this golf swing, this ball was going to start left and cut because there's too many times when I felt like I made the right swing and the ball didn't do what I wanted. And that's the, that's the scariest thing for me is I feel like when I make the right swing and the ball's not coming out the right window and it's not flying the way I want, you're going to have doubts on you know what's going on, and you're going to think it's, it's a technical issue when it really was never a technical issue. So a whole new the set gear. of clubs, or did they tweak the ones you had? Uh, so they built me up a brand new set of irons, same set of irons, everything. They just, instead of grinding the bounce off like they haven't, they've done uh, for the last couple of years, they just left the bounce left the on bounce. there. Yep. Interesting. Well, the gearheads are going to love this. They're going to eat that They're going to have people going into the pro shop being like, mm. I need some more bounce on my irons. You got to add it. This by the way, my suck. irons, I'm not fading it, so my irons are definitely too up. Yeah, exactly. I mean, all over America. They're all going to think that they I uh, gave them the, the magic secret, which it, it, it may not work for you. Hopefully it works for me. I do want to give you a huge compliment because you came out after Memorial. You gave that press conference. There's guys that go through this every single week on the PGA Tour, and it is really easy to get in front of a microphone in front of a camera when everything's going great and you're getting the accolades and you're hoisting trophies and all that. Anybody can do that, but when you're not – you could have easily passed on that press conference and said, no, nah, dude, I'm done. I'm not talking. Nobody would have thought anything. Nobody would have blamed it. But for you to get up there, because there's so many people out there that relate to that, I think, more than the guy that's shooting 22 under every single week, right? It's like, I'm putting in work. I am working hard. I'm not seeing the results. And I think, honestly, you probably gained a lot more fans just because, like, look, he's being honest about it. That's a tough spot to be in. And any golfer that's ever played golf competitively for any period of time has gone through this at some point, period. I can't think of I virtually, no you're virtually <laughs> anyone other than me. I pretty much flush it all the time. You know, I got asked that press conference. I, I signed my scorecard. I sat in the score room for, you know, a couple minutes. And when I got up, one of the PGA Tour media officials came in, could see by her face. I knew what she wanted to ask. And she's like, Billy, would you be willing to ask, answer some questions? And I, I, I hadn't thought about, like, if I was going to be interviewed or not. I just, I just said yes. Um, and as I'm walking over there, I know what the question was going to. I knew what the question was going to be, or at least some of the question was going to be. I had talked about in my pre-tournament uh, press conference the day before about where my game was, about where my confidence was, um, and how how tough of a year it's been for me. You know, just mentally a little bit. Um, and you know, at least thankfully he he asked the Florida Gator question first about the, the Gators winning the national title and everything. How cool that was. But obviously the question was asked. You know. You know how about today and, and where I felt where my game was and honestly it was it was just uh it was tough to talk about and I'm honest you guys know I'm honest I'm never gonna you know give you a uh you know just the a cliche the cliche yeah. answer uh, I'm going to tell you how I feel and and maybe I haven't always told you you know when I haven't felt confident with my game or you know when things aren't feeling right you know you sort of sometimes are a little protective of that but that that moment I couldn't protect anything. My confidence was was bad, and, and I didn't feel confident in my game. And um, yeah, I mean, listen, a thought crosses your mind. You know, I could easily say, you know, I'm injured or I'm sick, and I. But I, I can't do that. I can't look myself in the mirror. Um, you know, later at night or at any point later in the future, and say I've always given my all. I've never thrown in the towel. Um, that yeah. would be a moment that I, I would say you threw in the towel. You know, you can't hold yourself high the way you've always have so listen I was I'm very thankful for everyone that reached out to me uh, it meant a lot the message themselves weren't anything riveting or or, or shocking um, a lot of them were the same thing but what I thought would touch me so much is that for 
someone for anyone just to reach out and take a time and just sent a message that meant a lot and that's what was the thing that touched me the most is just taking time out of your day to, to reach out to someone and and and, and try to uh, you know give them some confidence and tell them how good they are or, or whatever the message was and that's what like I said I'm I'm very thankful for that and I had so many people you know on the PJ tour other athletes people in business I mean over la- over those that Thursday night, Friday, all Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. I mean, it was it was amazing how many people were shouting. Yeah, because you were real. Like you just don't yeah. see athletes do that a whole lot. And especially in this world nowadays, where there's so much hate, you know, <laughs> it's uh, it's frustrating. But it's it's cool to see. I mean, listen, I was when I first saw it, I immediately texted you. You did. You know, there was a lot of hate on social media. I fired back at them after several cocktails because those people pissed me off. Like they have no idea what you're going through. And, you know, we've all lived it. It's, it's a tough game. It beats you down. And it's an individual game. You know, Tom Brady can go out there and throw four interceptions. They can still win the game. Everything's okay. Yeah. You know, this, it, this is There's nowhere I mean. to hide Listen, as a and, golfer. And, 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 people, and the people that thought that I was crying because I shot 84, I'm like, I couldn't care. L-. I mean, I cared that I shot 84. I was upset that I shot 84. But I was just so down that I've worked so hard the last couple of months and not get any results. Yeah. And I feel like when I feel like something positive is right about to come, you know, I get kicked back, you know, back down the stairs a little bit, back down the steps. Um, and so it wasn't even about the 84. It was just about the grind and not seeing anything I've, I've gotten out of it. And as I said, I'm not the only one on the PJ Tour that has dealt with this. There's many no, of guys. Damn near everybody. Correct. And so, I, you know, I, I, that's why when I see guys, you know, in, in slumps and everything, you know, you try to, you know, encourage them. When they start playing well, you try to encourage them, hey, great playing. You know, keep it up. I see you working hard. Listen, it's going to turn. You know, it's just it's just the right thing to do. You know, you're just being human. You're looking after for somebody. And, um, listen, there's a lot of people that, you know, I that, listen, I saw the comments on some of the Twitter and social media. And at the end of the day, I feel sorry for them. Yeah. I, at the, I, I can't, I don't even get upset about the comments. I just feel sorry for them that they have to, attack someone else when things aren't going well when they're sharing how they're feeling and and being honest with the situation because honestly they probably can't do it themselves yeah from some anonymous account with no name behind it social media haters beat it yeah (laughs) no you are by the way one in particular it reminded me honestly (laughs) i know you're talking about (laughs) of like what a roller coaster golf is like you're talking about your struggles things like that you know who else did that recently on a Netflix show, Brooks Kapka talked about the same. Like, I don't know that I can beat these guys. Well, all these doubt. The first time you've ever heard doubt from that guy come out that I've heard come out of his mouth, and all of a sudden, look at what he's doing this year. You know what? Pretty damn good. It's, like it's, it changes quick. Brooks' persona changed when he was on that Netflix. Couldn't agree more. And people saw him in a different light. And you know, one of the guys that reached out was Claude Harmon. He sent me an gr- unbelievable message on 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 uh, Instagram, and uh, very thankful for it. And I saw him this week, and. You know, he saw me walk over. He knew exactly what I was going to say. And, again, thanked him. And, you know, he gave me some great, you know, another few words of encouragement. And, listen, it's we're, we're a tight-knit group out here. Yeah. We are a family. Even though we're trying to beat each other brains in all time, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you don't want to, when you're seeing other players that, you know, try to do the right things and work hard and are good people, you don't want to see them, you know, struggle. And you just always try to help them out whenever you can. That's awesome. I yep. love when the guys are trying to help I each thought, other out. Yeah. No, but here's the deal. No matter how you play, you always look great. You got, <laughs> your, you got your polo, your RLX on. Tell us about your relationship with them and how great it's been. And obviously, they're incredible clothing that we see here. Yeah, you know, I've, I've been very fortunate. It's my longest partner that I've had. Uh, we've been together since 2011. So what are we going on, 12, 13 years now? Mm-hmm. Um, listen, when people compliment compliment me on on what I wear and my you know how well I look and everything I'm like I'm just blessed I've got a really good clothing sponsor they make me look good uh, because I don't look very good in just regular <laughs> you know t-shirts and, and stuff that's not very stylish very uh, modest <laughs> very modest. and so uh, I've, I've enjoyed my relationship with them it's been uh, an unbelievable partnership I grew up a Ralph Lauren fan I grew up couldn't shop at stores like this and, and even in like Dillard's or anything. You know, I was shopping at the TJ Maxx when, you know, the, sh- the clothes that they had at Dillard's weren't, uh, after they've had them and they still had some extra, they were sending them to TJ Maxx and you got them for like five, seven, eight dollars. You know, I, w- I was getting those Ralph Lauren's and I remember I had this gray sweater uh, that had this massive American flag on when I was in high school and I wore it as much as I could. 
Um, and we know in Florida, it does not get very cold very often there. And whenever I could wear it, that sucker was on. I bet that was nice in July. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good thing to wear to the tanning booth, too. Exactly. You know what I mean? Uh, and so when the opportunity come, came to be part of Ralph Lauren and, and to be part of this, this unbelievable company and, and golfers that have been with Ralph Lauren before and still are like a Tom Watson um, and a Davis Love, uh, it was a dream come true. I couldn't have asked for a better clothing sponsor and a better partner to be with uh, in my career at golf. And like I said, there's not, there's, there's no other clothes in my closet that's not Ralph Lauren. Golf clothes, Ralph Lauren, obviously. Suits, shirts, workout clothes. Everything in my closet is Ralph Lauren to the T. Uh, and I'm very fortunate enough to have a sponsor that not only creates great golf clothes, but you know, anything else I need, any other type of clothes they have that is just as comfortable and just as stylish uh, of anything that's out there. Well, class you, gear for a class Yes, dude. exactly. You always look fantastic. But I know you have some pull around here. Sleaze is wondering if he can get one of these posters for his house. Yeah, just, you know. I'm a little worried over why that you thing. want I mean, it in your house. Don't ask Maybe it's not ceiling, for me. Maybe it's not for me. Know. Maybe it's for someone else. Oh. I need you to uh, confirm right now. You're not going to be jealous when next year you walk in here and you got gravy and sleaze right here, you know, taking <laughs> over a bit, taking I'm, over a few of the spots. I'm happy. You know I'm, hap- I mean? I'm always welcoming of, mm-hmm. of the new uh, ambassadors that Ralph Warren brings on. And if, if you guys happen to be up there with me in some pictures, oh. I'll, be, I'll be happy to step aside to make you, you know, you guys can look good. I, I, eyeballs floor. will start wandering. We'll be over in the <laughs> swimwear section probably where they're going to put us. You know what I mean? Uh, Lose some uh, sales. One last thing before we get out of here. I got to talk to you a little bit about our man, Robbie Zalznick, yeah. who mm-hmm. was our manager over on the Walker Cup team back in 07, been with the USGA forever, likes to be known as kind of the king of the pranks, which you see it on social media every once in a while. There's some good ones yeah. that he claims he comes up with. I want to know about some of your favorites, and do you actually believe he comes up with all these? No, listen, I tell everyone this, and I tell Robbie to his face. <laughs> Robbie's not the man behind the show. Or the okay. person behind the show. This might not be going the way Ginny, I planned. <laughs> Ginny is the best. Robbie just, uh, they put him up front to think that he does everything, but Ginny does all the hard lifting and, and everything. She's unbelievable. Robbie, you know, I would say he's just a pretty face at the front, but <laughs> some people may not say he has a pretty face. I don't know. This I totally think, isn't going to get me what I want. <laughs> she's the mastermind, but he's just the one that executes. No, listen, I've known, like Colt said, we've known Robbie since 2007. Uh, you know, what is that, 16 years. I mean, he's an unbelievable guy. Uh, he's awesome because we, we all give him a lot of crap. He gives us crap back. He creates these little little gags and, and stuff around U.S. Opens all the time. I've never been a part of it until the day when I try to walk in the player services trailer and he blocked me from the door. I'm like, what are you doing? Security. And there's a sign to the right of it that says, all players allowed except Justin Thomas, uh, Ricky Fowler, I think Jordan Spieth, and myself. And I was like, what is this BS? How did you get lumped in? I have no clue what I did wrong. Damn. Uh, I have no clue. And then, Why? Because you give Jenny all the credit. <laughs> probably. I think I probably, you know, and it was probably in front of cameras yesterday. There were some Netflix can- cameras in there. And I think mm. oh, I, think I was uh, saying Jenny needed to get a raise and needed, you know, a higher title or a better title. Uh, so... Who knows? I, I asked Robbie for some blue tape, um, and he's like, what do you need it for? I said, well, I need to tape up my bag. I got a hole in it. You know, you think he'd be smarter than this. So I took off, ripped off the piece of tape and, and covered up my name, but quickly he, he tore it back down. So. Of course, selfish. I did like whoever came up with it where it says lot A, player parking. I, Joel Damon proceeded to lot F. I, I yeah. saw that one. That one's Good. great. Yeah. Uh, you know, I always think the, the Charlie Hoffman and the Seagull always. picture – that was um, strong. On the, on the lockers, unbelievable. There's been some with Kevin Kisner that have happened. Uh, Adam Hadwin had a hard hat and, like, a vest, a vest for, like, the workers out there so he doesn't get tackled again. Yeah. Uh, there was another one this week. Um, maybe there was something about nobody, you know, everyone can put their bags in the locker except for this player and another player, and I think the other one is D. Lee, Danny Lee. But last I checked, Danny Lee wasn't in the U.S. Open this mm, week. Sorry, Danny. So, Robbie, that was a mess up by Robbie. Whoop. Uh, Doesn't hit quite as hard if you ain't here. Exactly. Yeah. So, listen, they do some pretty cool things. It's very unique. It's Robbie and his team that do an unbelievable job. They do an unbelievable job of taking care of us, anything we need throughout the week, you know, reservations, you know, any tickets or anything that comes up last minute. They are, they are 
very well organized and um, you know we can all take shots at the USGA in many different ways and, and at certain things they do but the player service team Robbie J Jenny and everyone else involved top notch best out there awesome man well hey we always appreciate you sitting down with us always a lot of fun go have you a, a hell of a week at the US Open I will thank you yes yeah. sir thanks boys appreciate you brother Beautiful. All right, that was our man Billy Horschel joining us on Subpar live from Ralph Lauren in Beverly Hills. A lot of fun to sit down with him, talk about his game. Hadn't been the best of as of late, but also get some cool insight into this week's U.S. Open because it's a golf course very few people are familiar with. Yeah, very few, unless you went to school in L.A. like a few of the guys have. Not many people have, have seen this thing, period, much less seen it in tournament competition. Always love getting a little inside scoop. Shout out to Billy, by the way, also the MVP of the Larry earlier this year yes. he put his life on the line to retrieve the football out of the lake pretty sure Wyndham threw it in there with that little that little bb gun arm that he's got but always fun sitting down with billy and also props to billy man when he got up there at muirfield and spoke on like the struggles and how hard it is and he's we're putting in the time and not getting it like a lot of guys shy away from the camera when things aren't going good they love that camera when things are going well and they're winning and they're getting all the accolades and everything like that um big big props to billy for doing that because that's not a not an easy thing to do and he didn't have to do it yeah, exactly. You know, they asked him and he did it. Um, yeah, and he owned you could it. easily say no and no one would no one would blame him. This game will beat you down, but always fun sitting down with Billy Ho, one of the nicest guys out on the PGA Tour. But some of golf's biggest tournaments are coming up and you can get inside the ropes with FanDuel. Because right now, new customers can get a no-sweat bet up to $2,500 back in bonus bets. We got the U.S. Open, major champion, time to make some major plays, top 20s, top 10s, head-to-head, whatever you want. And if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use. They're always giving you great odds. And when you win, you get paid instantly. So step up to the tee and take a swing at betting the PGA Tour. All right, U.S. Open. Here we go. The third major of the year. Obviously, all the best players in the world would be, be there. Kind of hard to bet against Brooks Kepka, in my opinion, considering he's gone second and first in the majors. But with the odds, um, this golf course, it's it's interesting, Sleaze. I mean, the average fairway is around 44 yards wide. So it's giving you plenty of room. Um, it's kind of a tricky little golf course. I think it's a second-shot golf course. Um, I like this man's odds. He's going to win a major championship at some point. Why not the U.S. Open? Xander Schauffele, 20-1. to 1. He's been knocking on the door for a long time, for a very long time. And for everything I'm hearing about this golf course this week, it's like it's patience. Yes, the fairways are wide, but if they slope left to right, you need to be able to move it right to left. If they slope the other way, you need to be able to move it the other way. And where you play from in the fairways is a big deal, not just hitting the fairway. There's a lot of strategy that goes into that, which is why, Colt, I'm picking his best friend and twin brother, perhaps, Patrick Cantlay at 17-1. to 1. Yes. Let's just say Rom and Scotty are the cream of the crop, right? Brooks Kepka, throw him in there too. Like they're in a different league. Just the odds aren't there for them. I know Cantley hasn't had maybe the major championship finishes that we expect from him, but 14th last year, top 10 at the PGA this year. If you're talking patience and and also just having played this golf course and having a little experience with um with it, I think plays a factor this week. He, Max Homer, those are two of the big name guys you'll hear about playing out at LACC. And uh, I think it's I think Patrick uh, may do it this week. Yeah, I mean UCLA is about. Two miles down the road, which is also equivalent to about an hour car ride. That's yeah, that's in LA. Exact, or a helicopter. Yeah, yeah quick helicopter or a two hour drive. All right. My dark horse. Th these odds are big, but I don't know really why. He's he went to school in California at Pepperdine. He kind of hits it all over the place, but he's a wizard around the greens and he's a great shot maker and he has a great attitude. You mentioned patience. This guy's got it. So why not make your first PGA tour win a major championship? Give it to me. Saith the gala 100 to one. That's a return. That's yes. a nice return. 100 to ones. We like those in the investment world. That would be spectacular if Sahith did it in his first one. He's got a lot of fans. He's an easy guy to root for. I would love to see Sahith play a, play a factor in this deal. I'm going to cut those odds in half, Colt. Okay. Mm. But this is still a dark horse. We're going off at 50 to one here. The guy's got a major championship. He's a former world number one. Uh, he also won earlier this year. His game has made a complete resurrection. He's hitting it good. His short, as you mentioned with Sahith, this is short game is spectacular. Maybe the best bunker player in the world for my money. The putter is uh, extraordinary as well. Give me Jason Day, fifty to one. All right. Why not fifty to one? That those those odds seem pretty juicy for a guy that's um is is playing good golf right now uh, and has a major championship under his belt. 
I mean, things have been going pretty well. Sleaze, you've had a couple winners lately. I mean, Tyrrell Hatton just missed the oh, playoff. We were close, dude. We were close. Open. I was like, oh, he might be able to sneak it in there. And then Nick Taylor made that putt. But, hey, stay hot. Go to FanDuel.com slash subpar and sign up. That's FanDuel.com slash subpar to get a no-sweat first bet up to $2,500. FanDuel, official betting operator of the PGA Tour. All right. Let's get it. Let's get amongst it at the U.S. Open this week. It is major championship season. That's going to do it for us. We'll talk to you on next week's subpar.